Today, I begin a short series entitled Following in the Steps of Jesus. I want to talk for a minute about the Corinthian church. If you go over to the book of Acts chapter 18, you'll discover Paul's introduction to the people of Corinth. He found Apollos, he found Apollos there, he found Aquila and Priscilla there, and all of them were working together to try to reach the Corinthians and establish a family of believers in that location, and they did. And so years later, Paul writes now back to this church in which he has invested his heart and his life, in which he has invested the gospel, and he shares with them some of the needs that he sees within that church family. All of us need someone that can look at us from the outside. We just went through a, a questionnaire, a, a kind of survey that interim ministry partners did of our church, and it told them and told us some things about ourselves. It gives us some opportunity to rejoice in some of the things that are growth, that are, that are strengths. It gives us a chance to look at some of the areas that are growth areas and to say, we haven't finished yet. We're still on the journey following God, following Jesus, where he is leading us. That is so needed. So Paul, as he looks at the first Corinthian or the Corinthian church, says here in first Corinthians 10, he indicates an attitude that existed in that church that is so prevalent in America today. I have the right to do anything you say. Is that not as current as it gets? Is that not as current as the newspapers we read, as the products we buy? I have the right to do anything I want. I have my rights. But notice Paul also says, but not everything is beneficial. The choices that we make, the people that we choose as friends, the places that we work, sometimes those situations do not work out for our growth, for our benefit, for our edification, is what some of the older translations say. So Paul says, the first thing I want to tell you, church at Corinth, is I want to tell you, yes, you have a right to make that statement. I have a right to do anything, but you need to realize that just because you have a right to do it, does not mean that it is best for you. This is a lesson that we work on so hard with ourselves and we work on so hard with our children. What are the consequences of things that we do? What is the outcome of the choices that we are going to make? People that follow Jesus have to make some tough choices. Also notice here that Paul says, quoting the Corinthians, I have the right to do anything. But he says again, not everything is constructive. There are a lot of ways you could go about putting up a house. Jesus says you can build a house on the sand. We could go over to Satellite Beach and we could find a big sandy place where it's wide and we could put a house there. But you know, it's not going to last very long because the foundation is not solid. The foundation is ever shifting. And so just because I have a right to do something does not mean it's going to benefit me. And let me broaden that by looking at the next verse. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Here enters in now a broader consideration. I'm not just looking at what is constructive or uh, beneficial for me, but now I'm trying to consider what is it that is constructive or beneficial for the body of Christ as a whole. Whoever serves in presidential office, whoever serves in the Congress, whoever serves in our local offices, they have to take into account not just one voice, but the voices of many. This is what makes the job so difficult. If I could just choose what I thought was best, everything would be great, but it doesn't work that way. And so it is when it comes to racial justice. So it is when it comes to dealing with people who are marginalized. So it is with those that, that don't have the benefits and pleasures that we have. We have to take into account the broad range of people that we serve and the broad range of people that are in our sphere of influence. And that certainly includes especially our church family. So in Corinth, just like Paul is going to describe it in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, there were people that were all about themselves. So they had their feast time, and during their meal times, their feast time, they would often stop the, in that meal and they would have communion. This was a common practice in the ancient church. But what was occurring 
was that people who had a lot, who were very wealthy, they brought this large feast in and they were just, just, just really filling their stomachs with everything they wanted without even considering the people in their church family that didn't have as much. And so they were hoarding their food and eating their food and, and, and being very satisfied themselves, not realizing there were others that they were getting ahead of, that they were eating ahead of and not considering that were being hurt by that. And Paul says, let me just back up and say this. Coming together is not about eating anyway. It's about remembering the body and blood of Jesus. And the body and blood of Jesus leads us to the place of sacrifice and serving the good of others above ourselves. There was also a special situation that existed in the Corinthian church. They lived in a time when people had temples all around them, and they had temples not just to God, but they had temples to pagan gods, and they would often sacrifice meat sacrifices to those gods. They would make animal sacrifices to the gods, you know? And furthermore, just like in Israel, you know, when they brought a sacrifice to the temple, all of that sacrifice, at least not every time, was burned up. Some of it was kept for the priest. Some of it was used for other purposes. And so these pagans would do something similar. They would take the meat, they would offer it, the animal, they would offer it, and then they would take the meat over to the marketplace and they would sell it. Well, what happened was, is that somebody who's a believer says, goes into the market and here's this unbeliever that's watching them, knowing that that meat has been sacrificed to idols. And here's this believer that buys and eats it. Well, that unbeliever feels like, well, they don't really believe in God or they believe in our gods now because they're eating the meat that we use to offer to our gods. And furthermore, let's take, let's say you have an immature believer who sees that happen who doesn't understand, who's not grown to maturity and knows that the meat really doesn't mean anything. It's not the meat that's important, really, is it? It's what we're devoted to. And so they might be offended as well. So Paul is addressing that in these next few verses. He says, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Now, for one who's a believer, for the one who believes that God owns everything, that he created everything, that he gave all the, the food of the earth, the animals and the, the plants and everything for people to have, to sustain themselves, to eat from, for the person that has that understanding, it's not a problem for them to go to any meat market and eat the meat because they know it doesn't mean anything that that meat has been sacrificed to some idol or some, something that somebody thinks is an idol. So for the person who's the mature believer, it's not a problem. But he goes on, if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. So if I, as a mature believer, even if I'm in an unbeliever's home and I know he's offering me this meal, I'm not going to worry about where it came from. It's not going to bother me at all because I know God is God and he is the father of the universe and he created and made all things for our benefit. But he says, if someone says to you, let's say again, you're at that same table and before you start eating, this unbeliever says, you know, this has been offered in sacrifice. Then he says, do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For after all, that person didn't just randomly say to you, you know, this meat has been sacrificed to an idol. It's a kind of test question. I'm going to find out if you really believe in God. I'm going to find out really where you stand. Do you believe in all gods, including your God, or do you just serve and believe in the God of heaven? And so when that test is put before us, every time we answer the question, no, thank you, I wouldn't care for any. That's the way we handle it. There are always tests in the world. The world is always pushing to try to find out whether or not we will join in with them in believing all the things that they believe or if we will stand for what we have firmly declared we believe and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul goes on, for why is my freedom being judged by another person's conscience? That's a good question. I might be sitting there and thinking, you know, I have the right to do anything. I don't care what this other person believes. And that is a position of immaturity. If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? And the truth is, I am not. 
If I don't have a problem with eating any kind of meat, God is not going to condemn me for doing that. God is not going to consider me a pagan worshiper just because I eat some meal that may have been presented in some way to a God. But when it's in the environment where another person who doesn't understand is involved, I have to take into account not just my feelings, not just my rights, not just what is the best for me, but what is the best for everyone included. My brothers and sisters, if we begin to do that today, going forward, if we begin to ask the question about every activity we engage in, about every post we put on face, social media, about every decision that we made, if we started to ask the question, not just is it beneficial for me, but is it beneficial for others, then we would start to move further down the path of following in the steps of Jesus. Jesus had the ability not to selfishly make decisions, but to make decisions that serve the broader good of people involved. That's what we are called to do. So here's Paul's conclusion. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So here is another gate as we follow Jesus that we walk through. If I'm trying to make a decision about what to eat or what to do or how to behave, I'm going to ask the question, first of all, does it give glory to God? Now, think back on your past week. Think back on the things that you were involved in this week, the choices that you made. I want to ask you, when you were making those choices, did you consider whether or not it gave glory to God? This is another thing that, those that we do as followers of Jesus. Do not cause anyone to stumble, he says here in this text, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. Now, does that mean that Paul was always a people pleaser and he didn't care what people believed or wanted? He just tried to please them? No. He already says that that's, he says something other than that earlier in the book. He says, what I've done is I've become all things to all people that by some means I might save some. That was Paul's goal. The reason he was trying to get along with people is so that he could get the gospel message to them and have them to listen to that gospel message. So Paul says, for I am not seeking my own good, 1 Corinthians 10, but the good of many so that they may be saved. There is the goal of this Christ following life. There is the goal of giving in when somebody says, you know, I offered this meat to idols or this meat was offered to idols at the temple of Artemis or whoever. You know, in those situations, I consider, okay, I won't participate because I want this other person to know who I serve, whom I serve. And I want that other person to know that I want them also to know about God and know about Jesus as well. When I make a choice, I don't do it for myself. I'm doing it for others so that they might come to know God and be saved. And Paul concludes, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, would it not be great if every one of us, for anybody we're trying to influence, could say to that person, follow my example as I follow Christ. Now, there is another implication in that statement. The implication is, don't follow me if I'm not following Christ. So as I'm looking at somebody, I don't care who it is, the preacher, an elder, a, a person that you hold in high esteem, if that person is following Jesus, yes, you can follow their example. But if they are not following Jesus, as all of us are going to fail and make mistakes, we do not follow them. The ultimate goal is to follow in the steps of Jesus and only to follow other people as they are following that same example. Let me kind of bring it together here and say that in the life of the Apostle Paul, he had a life guiding principle, and he repeats it over and over again in his writings. I'm going to give you two of them. The first one is in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. Here's what he says. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The evil one is all about chaos. The world is about chaos. We look at things, I mean, you think about your, your future financial plan, you look at the, what could happen in your job, you look at all the complications of life, and it's so easy to allow that confusion and chaos to suck you in. 
and to get you so anxious and so full of worry that you can't get anything done. It just stymies you. But Paul says, whenever I get down to those quiet moments, whenever I consider what really is driving my life, here's what it is. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, is the life of Jesus important? Yes. Is the, is the, the burial of Jesus important? Yes. Is the resurrection of Jesus important? Yes. But we would have had none of those things if it had not been for Jesus' willingness to be crucified, to go to the cross in our behalf to go to the cross as a condemned criminal so that we, the world, all of us in the world, might be saved. Paul says it a different way in Galatians 6, verse 14. He says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. As I am following Christ, I look to him and I see how he gave himself in sacrifice for me. And I realize that my whole life would be nothing without the cross of Jesus. And so when I'm making a choice, when I'm living my life, the thing that centers me and that's at my core is the fact that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And I will never boast and never brag in anything else but that. In conclusion, I would like to ask you, in what area or areas of your life do you need to grow to be more like Jesus? I want to give you three scriptures. What I'm going to do at the end of this series, I'm going to give you a little worksheet. And on that worksheet, it's going to give you an opportunity to answer several different questions about what would help you to follow Jesus. And as we look to this new year, we're not far away now. As we look to this new year, this is going to be a kind of spiritual growth plan that you can use that will be practical and will be geared just toward you. So what I encourage you to do is to take these three texts, Matthew 5 through 7, Galatians 5, 13 through 26, and Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Each one of those texts will give you an opportunity to reflect on your own life. It will give you an opportunity to compare your life to the teachings and to the practices of Jesus. And furthermore, it will give you a chance to look at those spirit-filled qualities that God wants you to have in your life. And you can make a choice. You can look and see immediately as you read through Matthew 5, verse 7. You can say, you know, I can see where lust is a big problem in my life. I can see where anger is really driving my life. I can see where my life is not built on a very solid foundation. That's all in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. I can look at Galatians 5 and I can look at those works of the flesh. And I can say, you know, when I start to stack up my life to the works of the flesh and works of the Spirit, thank the good Lord, my life is more centered in the, in the fruit of the Spirit than it is in the works of the flesh. And as you look at Colossians 3 and he talks about those things that you need to put on and things you need to put off, you can say, you know, I really need to put off these two qualities in my life. I need to get rid of that. I need to set it aside. This new year, I need to set as a goal to, to, to put those things aside, to ask forgiveness and to lift up these other qualities and put them on as I enter each day of my life. But the goal is, as always, to follow in the steps of Jesus. Let's pray. God, our Father, we're so thankful that we are your children. We're so thankful for this church. I am so thankful for 36 and a half years of blessed experience. Yes, there have been so many difficult, uh, difficult situations that we have faced along the way. This church has been on a huge journey over the last 36 years. But now, Lord, you're bringing us to the future. You're bringing us to a place where we're going to take the next step. And Lord, we know that you're going to do far greater than what you've ever done through the people of this church, its leadership, and those that will come to serve. Lord, guide us. Help us to walk in the steps of Jesus. And today, Lord, help us to open up your word, open up those three passages of scripture and ask the question, how can I follow Jesus in a more devoted way? How can I build my life around the cross of Jesus? We pray through him who gave his life for us, that lives together with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.